Good morning, everyone. Oh, you're going to introduce me? Oh, go ahead then. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anil Bopala. I'm a research assistant here at C21U. I'm happy to introduce Professor Charles as well today. Uh, he's going to speak to us about the overview of the OMSCS program, share with us some of the lessons learned, and uh, talk about where the program is going. We are happy to have you here. All right, thank you. So let's try that again. Good morning. <laughs> Good. So um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the OMSCS, and that's what I'm going to do. But I'm going to do something a little different from what I normally do. So normally I have a, a talk like this that I give. It takes about an hour little with questions and then sort of drifts on for another 20 minutes or so. Um, uh, but what I'm going to try to do this time is to give a much more abbreviated version of that talk. Um, I'm going to plan for something closer to 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, including, question, including at least some clarifying questions, and just open it up for whatever it is you want to discuss. So um, I am Charles Isbell. I'm a professor in uh, the School of Interactive Computing, and I'm also the Senior Associate Dean for the College of Computing. Uh, that means two things. One, I'm going to be a professor, and I'm going to make a lot of statements with absolute authority um, and just expect you to believe it. Um, so if you do not believe it, you should feel free to interrupt and ask me whatever you want. I'm also going to be an administrator, and I'm going to try to avoid telling you some of the more complicated things that I don't particularly want to share. So you should also hold my feet to the fire on that and make sure you ask me whatever you want to. We're all among friends. Now, the part of the talk that I'm going to skip is the bit at the beginning where I talk about why we decided to go down this path, why it is we thought it was important, exactly how it went through. Um, uh, faculty governance, uh, the whole process of Udacity, why it is we chose Udacity over some of the other options, and those sorts of details, because at least some of you in this room already know that, and it really does take up uh, quite a bit of time. But if you're interested in that, you should feel free to, to ask me why we made some of the decisions that we did. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to jump in, talk a little bit about the OMS, and go directly to sort of the, the lessons learned. So is that fair? OK, good. So again, if you have any questions, we have a bunch of people here who know a lot of the details. I know a bunch of the details, and, and I'm happy to talk about them. I want this to be much more of a conversation uh, than normal. So just for the one or two of you who don't know all the details, what are we talking about? What is the OMSCS? Well, it's very simple. It is a Master of Science in Computer Science. It is indistinguishable from our on-campus degree. So there is no distinction on the transcript. There is no distinction on the diploma. Um, in fact, it's very difficult to determine whether a student is in the OMS or not. We, the only way that we have for doing that really on a sort of day-by-day -day basis is that OMS students are enrolled in a different campus. But they get the same degree, they have the same requirements, they have uh, what you need to get in, all of the, the minimum requirements are the same, what you need to graduate are all the same. And the idea here, briefly, was to take this notion of MOOCs, which if we go back three or four years, it was something everyone uh, was talking about, and see if we could apply it not just to a course or to a sequence of courses, but to an actual degree. If we could make it a real thing that would help us to understand what it would mean to sort of do this delivery mechanism. There are a lot of implications of that, and I think there's one that's very significant, um, sort of a philosophical distinction that I'll, I'll get to towards uh, the end of the talk. The other part about the OMSCS that was important, other than it was uh, so meant to be the same as our on-campus degree, meant to be the first of its kind from an elite university like Georgia Tech, was its cost. So the average cost for a student going through this program is about $6,600. That's for the entire degree, and that is different from uh, the 44 or now 46 or whatever the, the recent tuition is, sort of average cost for people on campus. There was a lot that sort of went through, went into getting that number, but the goal was not to make a lot of money, but it was also not to lose any money. So we want to have just a little bit of a buffer so that if we were wrong about some of our costs, things would be OK. But the goal was basically to at least break even and be able to make a little bit more so that we could reinvest it into the program. Other things that distinguish this degree is that it's a collaboration between Georgia Tech, Udacity, and AT&T. AT&T uh, has given us uh, the funds necessary to do, deal with all of the startup costs. We announced it in May of 2013. We are now um, in the middle of our seventh term. Yes. What is a MOOC and a MOOD? Well, a MOOC is a MOOC, Massively Open Online course, and a MOOD is a Massively Open Online degree. And that was sort of the goal here. By the way, one of the things that you'll see, and I will return to this again and again, is that it turns out that all the interesting questions, at least from my point of view, uh, stems from the fact that we're trying to do a degree. 
not just a course or even a sequence of possibly mildly related courses. But that notion of what it means to g try to create a degree program as opposed to try to create courses is significant and I think the most significant thing to actually come out of this. But if you don't believe me, you should feel free to, to challenge that as we move along. So one thing that I will say before talking about the degree itself and just some of the sort of the details is to point out that there's one thing that we did decide to do with this uh, that I think is important to sort of set the stage for what it means when you start thinking about something like a degree, and it really boils down to this question of what's in it for the faculty. If I were to talk to you about the uh, discussions that went among the faculty as a part of the governance process for, for getting this degree approved, I could boil it down to saying that what they really cared about was quality. Quality, quality, quality. They were afraid that we might compromise quality in doing this, and so a lot of the things that are going on with that degree are all about avoiding compromising quality. But what's in it for the faculty in general? Well, as any of you who've thought about these sorts of things before and have been paying attention over the last couple of years knows, it's an opportunity to improve pedagogy. It's an opportunity to try to do something different. We have flipped classrooms, there's all these sorts of things we're doing. I don't think I have to tell you, you're at C21U. Almost all of the instructors who've gone through this process of converting their on-campus courses, the vast majority of these things are, are courses that we um, have been teaching for many, many years, uh, into the OMS um, format, have all said that they've gained new insights into to teaching the course. Um, and I think there are a couple of reasons for that. So I teach two of the courses in here. And uh, for me, it was simply, if nothing else, a mechanism for forcing myself to rethink my course. I've been teaching that course um, at that point for 12 years. It was doing just fine. I knew what to do, I knew what the questions were, I had the same exam that I gave every year. The uh, difference between the median scores on my midterms across those 10 years was like one or two points. The variance was the same. I really had that course down and I wasn't really forced to, to rethink it because it was working great. Having put into this format and think about what it meant required me to completely rethink the course and understand what it was that I was actually accomplishing and what I wasn't accomplishing. And I think lots of people have a story like that. Tucker's in the room, so I think Tucker would agree with me if he said that one of the things that a lot of the faculty like um, about the idea of doing this is fame. Tucker once said that um, he is now in one, in one semester taught more students than he taught in his previous 10 or 15 or 20 or how many years you've been at Georgia Tech before. And all of these people know who you are and you're sort of reproducing and creating disciples of Tucker, disciples of Charles. Now, even though there was a lot of motivation for faculty to do this, we wanted to go beyond this sort of intrinsic motivation and try to come up with a compensation model, and one that made sense given what we were trying to do. So here are the details. We pay faculty for doing this. We treat it as extra comp. It is separate from their normal teaching load. You get money for creating a course, you get money for teaching a course, and you get money for the course being offered independent of whether you teach it or not. In particular, you get $20,000 if you create, when you create a course. You get $10,000 every time that you teach the course, whether you created it or not. And every time the course is taught, every term that it is taught, you receive $2,500. Like royalties. These are not royalties because that's a legal term and any lawyers in the room would start yelling at me if I were to say they're royalties, but for the purposes of this discussion, let's pretend they're royalties. It turns out, I won't get into a lot of detail about this, but it turns out that uh, this lines up very neatly with sort of normal notions of workload. There are various people around the country that have begun doing these sorts of things, and it appears that we've all kind of converged accidentally on the same kind of workload model. Roughly creating a course is equal to teaching a course on campus, roughly teaching a course is about half as much work, um, and sort of your intellectual effort is worth some nominal thing that kind of goes on whether you're, you're involved or not. And just about everyone, given their sort of local pay scales, has roughly come to the, to the same place, which I think is interesting. We didn't set out to do it that way, but the numbers that we chose turn out to be that way. So if we're interested at some point in taking this and uh, thinking about it as being part of the normal course load, we do have a mechanism for thinking about um, what we might do. But we have no plans for, for doing that and making it part of the normal course of life. Does this make sense? Any questions about this? Yes. What is a flipped classroom? That's when instead of me standing up here and lecturing to you about the wonders of decision trees and instance-based learning, uh, I instead have you watch the lectures um, and then we come in and we just work on projects or we, I just say, any questions? And we talk about what it is you've done. In principle, it's what courses were always supposed to be like. Right? You were supposed to read books and other materials before you came in, and then you'd come in the room, and I would say, are there any questions? But of course, that never happens. The flipped classroom sort of forces that to happen. And there's lots of thought and pedagogy goes back you know, many, many years about how to make that work right. And there are lots of faculty who are doing this. Are you doing flipped? I haven't figured out how to do 
Yeah. There, there are books on it. I think there's probably a MOOC on it. Maybe we could talk about it later. Yeah. Was there a question? So uh, there's multiple answers. Did anybody hear the question, by the way? Do I need to repeat it? So the question is, so how often do you have to refresh the course? So we built into the original budget the notion that it would be roughly once every three years. Uh, it's turned out to be pretty much zero uh, over the last three years. So we have yet to have to refresh a course for reasons that have to do with the material needing to be updated. Some of that, I think, is an artifact of the fact that these are graduate level master's courses um, and they're by and large, and even the advanced courses are in some sense introductory. So if you were to ask me, well, how often do I need to update my calculus course? The answer would be not very often because calculus changes relatively slowly at the introductory level. That's also true for even introductory machine learning. It's true for uh, a lot of uh, the sort of courses that we tend to teach. We are just getting to the point now that we're filling out the degree that we're seeing courses that feel more like seminars and are meant to be more sort of research focused. And so I think in another year or two, we'll have a better feel for how often that sort of needs to be updated. But if I had to guess, um, I would say we're looking at something on the order of, on average, once every five or six years, depending upon the course. So it's actually remarkably stable for a lot of the courses that we care about. So the question has to do with about the, about the cost of the course and whether it's that's sort of where uh, all the money comes in, and the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, our original estimates were somewhere between $150,000 and $300,000 a course. If you include everybody's time, those numbers are probably a little higher uh, than we expected them to be. They're actually, I mean, they're lower than we expected. Uh, but effectively, all the cost is in creating the courses. You're basically making a movie, right? This isn't just, you know, Coursera calls you up and says, here's the web page you, you know, you can upload your video files to. There's uh, course developers as well as the instructor. There an e are editors involved. There's all these sort of professionals like making a movie and it costs a lot of money. So if you ask what AT&T brought to the table besides, you know, partnership energy and ideas, it was enough money to effectively cover our initial costs so that we didn't have to worry about building that in uh, to the degree. Once you have the material, particularly if it turns out that it's relatively stable, then everything, every time you teach it's just gravy. Now, it's not entirely that. You still need to have a head TA. You still need to have someone uh, who, you need to have graders. We'll see that later. You need to have an actual instructor who can answer questions. They're actually quite engaging, and, and the students are engaged, and the instructors and TAs are also engaged. But the truth is that cost is dwarfed. I mean, it's like literally an order or sometimes two orders of magnitude more than um, sort of the ongoing cost of the course. All right, so that's the OMSCS. Here's how it has gone over the last three years. For our very first set of applicants, we opened up uh, an application process um, two, uh, a little over two years ago now uh, for three weeks. We received 2,361 applications during that time period. That's twice as much as we normally receive in a given year for our on-campus MSCS, and our on-campus MSCS is one of the larger ones in the country. We ended up accepting um, or not rejecting a, a pretty significant uh, portion of the initial cohort. To understand why this matters and why some of the rest of these numbers matter, you have to understand what happens on campus. So we receive, you know, 1,500 or so, depending upon what you're counting, 1,200, 1,500 applications a year. Those numbers have been going up over the last couple of years. And on average, we accept about 10% of them. We accept 10% of them because we don't have room to accept anymore. I would estimate that somewhere between 60 to 75% of the students who apply to our on-campus master's program are well above bar. They're qualified. They could do well in the program. But we just don't have the room to handle them, and so we have to reject them. It's actually worse than that. If you, we did this experiment a couple of times, sort of did the statistical test. If you look at the top 10% and then the next 10% and the next 10%, they're statistically indistinguishable from one another. So it's a lottery. This is true at the undergraduate level, it's true at the graduate level. And part of the hope of this, and where we think we're, we've gotten to now, is that we have removed the lottery part of it. Our goal here, this is something that um, our dean has articulated multiple times, is to accept every single person we believe can succeed. Because we aren't limited by space. If we can handle the resources that are necessary to give them a good experience, then we should be able to accept anyone 
who we believe can succeed. That's a little bit more difficult perhaps than it sounds. You can't just accept every single person. You don't want to accept someone you're pretty sure would fail. That would be both unethical and it would hurt the program because it would hurt the other students because they'd be, you'd be putting all your energy into the students who aren't going to succeed. And so that's actually quite a bit of a, a tight walk. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And, and uh, I think it's actually in some ways the most difficult and thorniest part of uh, what we're doing with the OMSCS is trying to actually understand what it means uh, to be qualified to be in a program. So we accepted uh, a bunch of people. We accepted 380 students, 400 students uh, for the first semester. We kept it small just in case everything went pear-shaped. We knew that we could handle 400 students, even if the entire thing collapsed, because that's how many we were accepting on campus. Uh, that didn't mean we rejected the other 2,000 students. We simply didn't accept them in the first semester. Many of them we deferred um, to the second and, and to the third semester. That is now all stabilized. So as of October of 2013, we had 6,850 applicants. We accepted about 55% of them. That number has been roughly steady over the last year. Uh, and the demographics of the students are kind of interesting. 100 countries represented all 50 US states. The vast majority of the students who apply are already degree holders working in computing or IT, not all of them, and increasingly less of them, but many of them are already working full-time job, full jobs. In fact, as of last semester, 725 of them have advanced degrees going through our program. 125 of them actually have PhDs um, in some field. We had, at the time, roughly 80% Actually, the first semester is 85%, but it's sort of held steady at about 80% of the applicants are US citizens or permanent residents. This is the complement of our on-campus program. Our on-campus program, roughly 85% of the applicants are non-US citizens, the vast majority of whom are actually from India, followed by China. Just to give you a feel for how big that number is, although the College of Computing is at the time, two or three years ago, about 10% of the university, we were responsible for a third of its Indian population. And that's entirely because of our master's program, effectively. But for the online program, for OMSCS, it's the complement of that. They're all, almost all, US citizens. Average age is about 35, so they're about 11 years older than our on-campus students. Um, they are, in fact, really truly from all 50 states. I think these, either the largest or second largest uh, pool of students comes from California, uh, which is not what our on-campus program looks like. So these students are older. They're working uh, full-time, most of them. Uh, they're already working in IT. They want to, to have uh, a chance to get an advanced degree. Some of them are just doing it because they want to learn, but a lot of them, you need that in order to, to get the next job you want, or you need that to get the next promotion. And the truth is, you're in California, you've got a mortgage, you've got two kids, you're not gonna kill your job, go away for two years and come to Atlanta, and the only thing you know about Atlanta is that it's in the South, and the only thing you know about the South is that there are banjos and swamps, and you don't want to go there, and this is actually a, a real problem uh, for universities that are, that are located in the South, for people who aren't from the South, and this gives them an opportunity to do something they couldn't otherwise do. At the very end, I'll, I'll share some numbers with you about this, but what this basically indicates is that we're expanding the market. We're not cannibalizing our on-campus, and we're not even cannibalizing uh, master's programs from other universities. Now, the demographics of our applicants, it turns out, um, are mirrored in the demographics of those who are enrolled. So as of fall 2015, we have about 3,500 unique enrollments. Uh, we cannot give you final numbers for this semester, but right now it looks like it's, it's north of 3,400 people enrolled. So we're well over uh, 3,000. I'll show you a graph in just a second. We had our first 18 students graduate this past December. 13 of them, was it 13? 13 of them came on campus and actually marched. Um, there are some interesting things that are worth mentioning that, that a lot of people uh, sort of find interesting, at least faculty kind of find interesting, and that's our enrollment melt. For any given semester, about 20% of students uh, drop out of their courses, which effectively means dropping out of the program because most of them are taking one or two uh, classes. And we have no idea whether that's good or bad. That's higher, it's roughly twice as high as what we see on campus most semesters, but we don't know what that means. If $6,600 is the cost of the entire degree, that means any given semester you're paying $600, you're already working full time, what's $600? Maybe I'd rather lose part of that $600 to guarantee that I'm gonna get an A the next semester. So, I mean, I've got a house, I've got a car, I'm living in California, I can afford $600. I mean, it probably burned $600 on the watch that they bought 
right, the, in the previous semester or whatever it is Apple tells them they, they have to buy that year. And so it's not clear what this means. What does it mean when um, you're taking one or two classes instead of four classes? What does it mean when you don't have to worry about a visa and you have to be a full-time student? So a lot of our on-campus students can't drop courses because if they do, they get kicked out of the country. But these students, this isn't a problem, whether you're a US citizen or not, I'll just drop a course and it doesn't matter. And so far, the vast majority of these people return. So even if they drop a course and appear to be dropping out of school, because again, they're only taking one course, they come back the next semester because they're all part-time students. And this is sort of an opportunity for them to do, um, to go through the program at the pace that they wanna go through with respect to the entire program, if not with respect to the, the individual courses. So one story that's sort of worth pointing out um, is that what we decided to do in the first semester and what we've continued to do for all new students is we limit them to no more than two courses their first semester. Typically, the first semester we were inundated with emails, V got emails, I got lots of emails, um, demanding that we allow them to take as many courses as they want to. We're grown adults, we know what we're doing. I have a degree from whatever famous university they got a degree from. Um, and we said no, we held the line. And then about halfway through the semester, we started getting emails from people saying, thank you so much for not letting me take more than two classes. In fact, I'm dropping down to one class. This was far harder than I thought it would be, but I promise you I'll be back. I get emails like that every semester from first time students saying, this is a real degree, this is really hard. I didn't realize just how much work it would be. I'll be back, I will take more courses. We do have students occasionally taking three. The vast majority of them, I think the average is something like 1.3, 1.4 uh, classes a term. So if you were to make a graph of that, this is what our enrollment growth looks like from the first semester. Okay. Yes, yes. The criteria? Yeah, so um, except, of course, that we can accept more OMS students, but we have the same minimum requirements. Now, there's one, only one difference between the requirements for the OMS students and the requirements for the on-campus students. Uh, on-campus students have to take the GRE. Um, we do not require that the OMS students take the GRE. The truth is the GRE has zero predictive power um, for our students, it's totally uncorrelated, it doesn't mean anything. Um, I'm not entirely sure why we still do it. Do we have to do it? Do we have to require the GRE? Well good, then maybe we'll stop doing that. So we do require the GRE mostly out of habit, we don't do it for the on online students, but what we do to the online students is everyone who's accepted is accepted conditionally. So you must, within your first calendar year, earn a B or better in two what's called core courses, or foundational courses. The, the name is a bit of a misnomer, it's just a subset of courses that we think require a lot of work. Um, and if you're a foundational course, you have to take at least two of those and get a B or better, otherwise you get kicked out of the program. So you're conditionally admitted. But beyond that, the sort of minimum requirements, what it is that we expect to be above bar, is the same, GRE notwithstanding. No, because we can only accept the sixth of the ones who are qualified on campus. But given the lottery, if they would be above bar, most of them, and if you flip the coin, they would have you know a one, six, one out of six chance of getting in. So the real answer is they're equally as qualified as the students who are qualified to get in on campus. The first semester we did this, and I guess the second and third semester we did this, for, we, we compared all the courses that were being taught on campus and online at the same time, and the grades were basically statistically insignificant. So they appear to be performing just as well. That's a very weird measure though, it's not clear to me that that really means anything, uh, but at least it wasn't wildly different. So that's some suggestion uh, that the students are, are doing just as well. And I think that if we, were, you know, if we had enough room and we had enough resources and we accepted five times as many people on campus, you know, they would do just as well as the ones we happen to let in because, you know, their, letter, their last name started with an A instead of a Z. Yes? So our alum, several alum expressed this, this concern in the very beginning. I'm not hearing them express it anymore. Obviously the students online are like, yes, this is great, please do more of this. Um, I don't hear much from the on-campus students in this population, in the master's population. I think there was some concern about that, but it appears to have completely dissipated. I mean, the truth is at the end of the day, we're a gigantic university, you know, 
we produce a lot more masters of science, computer science students, it's okay as long as they go out in the world and they do well. And it's not like the, they can't get jobs, right? So I think it's, it's working out just fine. And again, we're not compromising our standards. So that means that, you know, <laughs> so V likes to tell this joke that I really like is, which is the, the way that you know you're a good university is that your output isn't much worse than your input, right? So you do sort of minimal damage to students while they're here. Uh, and so we're still getting good students. We're doing minimal damage to them, and then they're going out in the world, and they're, they're doing pretty well. So I think those concerns have turned out to be unfounded. Yes, sir? At least. Uh, anyway, um, we uh, sort them according to objective criteria. Um, uh, very, uh, grades, quality of school, CEO of the is very important. Uh, but there is a, uh, a cutoff uh, above which we consider the rest. Um, then we sort them. That's right. So, so since I was going to say this to the end, but since you brought it up, I'll talk about it now. I think this whole notion of accepting everyone who's qualified is a very tricky one. So as Tucker pointed out, right, you have this kind of line, um, and Georgia Tech has minimum requirements, right? You have to have an actual undergraduate degree. You have to have a 2.0 or something. I don't know what the minimums are, but there's some number. Um, the truth is those numbers are totally made up, okay? We have never had to deal with them, not at a place like Georgia Tech. So I think this is easy to see if you think about undergraduates. So the average incoming GPA for the undergrads at Georgia Tech is? It's a 4.0. Okay. Yeah, it's higher than that because I mean, in my day, you didn't get extra points for taking an AP test, but whatever. So you know, the average incoming GPA is like 4.0. Our minimum requirement to get into Georgia Tech from high school is probably something like a 3.0. 2.0, who knows? It doesn't matter, because the average incoming GPA is a 4.0, who cares? The average incoming um, SAT score this year, this past year, was somewhere around 1,500. In computer science, by the way, uh, we have the highest average incoming um, SAT scores. Not that those are important, I don't believe in SATs, but for <laughs> those of you who are not in the College of Computing, I just want to point out that our students or better than yours. Okay, so the point is that we have the students that we accept um, into the undergraduate program are so far above this made up bar that who cares whether the bar is good or bad. Now imagine, and this is true at the graduate level as well, now imagine you said, well, we have this given to us from God, we have these minimum requirements, and we want to accept everyone who's qualified. Well, as you start going down that list, very suddenly the fact that this line is down here matters. What if it had been 3.1? What if it had been 2.9? I mean, is that better? Is it worse? We actually read all of their statements of interest. We read the letters of recommendation. Who even knows what that means? You can't turn that into a number. So maybe the 3.0 minimum or whatever it is is insanely high. Maybe it's insanely low. We have absolutely no way of knowing because we've never had to think about it before. But now we're actually in a situation where we're getting thousands of students applying every year and many of them are at whatever artificial line we made up, and we want to accept them if we believe they can succeed. So that line suddenly becomes important. The amount of energy you need to put into the 3.0 line, or the 2.7 line, or the 3.2 line, or whatever it is, is immense. And the 
current, the way the world currently works is all you care about is not generating false positives. You actually don't care about generating false negatives, which, is, which has massive impact on things like diversity. There's a whole bunch of sort of very clear and, and easy to see problems with that. But given that you can only accept a seventh of the qualified people anyway, who cares? But now if you want to accept all of them, it becomes very difficult. So I think when we sit there and we try to think about what it means to accept students, what does it mean to actually evaluate them? I mean, I can tell you, I won't blame Tucker for this, but I'm in the same school that he's in, and I can tell you the faculty's sort of the way they think about whether a student is qualified or not is just in, it's demonstrably insane, but it doesn't matter, right? But now it does matter for this program. And so I think we have to give a lot of thought into what does it mean to want to accept someone who's qualified. And again, you can't say, well, screw it, we'll just accept everybody. The only qualification is a Visa or MasterCard or Amex. You can't do that because it's, no matter how cheap it is, it is wrong to accept someone in the program you are completely sure is gonna fail. So keep that sort of thing in mind. This is sort of what happens when you're dealing with a degree instead of a course, when you're actually giving credit. And by the way, it actually impacts Georgia Tech's reputation, but never mind that, it has a huge impact on the students. And our sort of ethical obligations that we mostly get to avoid, it, don't have to think about because it just never comes up, suddenly come up every day, every semester, every time uh, we think through these courses. So let me just tell you a little bit more about the enrollment. Um, What's interesting here is this shows the percentage of the students who are underrepresented minorities um, or who are women, uh, both for online and on campus. Uh, I will just leave you with a, an interesting sort of statistical fact, which is that um, the number of women online is, well, yeah. the number of women on the OMSCS initially was lower than the percentage of women of, uh, who were on campus. And we were quite concerned about that. at t was quite concerned about that. Um, we were trying to figure out what's going on. Interestingly, the number of under the percentage of underrepresented minorities is higher. This actually makes sense if you if you think about where the on-campus students are coming from. But then it turns out that that's not true. It turns out that if you instead ask the question, what's the percentage of women on campus? What's the percentage of women online? But instead ask, what's the percentage of U.S. citizens who are women? on campus, U.S. citizens who are non-U.S. citizens on campus, U.S. citizens online, non-U.S. citizens online, the numbers are the same. So in fact, the problem that we have with uh, attracting women into the program is uh, an American problem. The reason the percentage of women on campus is higher is because the percentage of women who pursue graduate degrees in computer science from India and China is significantly higher than the percentage who pursue it from the United States. Yes? So with regard to um, the optics degree and uh, the online program, what's the incentive for somebody to get an optics Well, there's two incentives, one of which I've implied strongly. Why would you come, why would anybody come here from India, say, uh, to get an on-campus degree? There's exactly one reason. What? <laughs> the swamps? Those banjo playing, I mean, there's grit, cheese and grits. No, it's, I, like the I know you do, Tucker, but we, <laughs> we said we wouldn't talk about that. The, um, it's to get a job. It's to get a visa. So you can get in the US and then you can get an internship at Google or Microsoft and then get a job. It's just that simple. So the truth is for most, not for all, but for many of the foreign nationals who apply to the United States for something like a CS degree, they basically just go to whatever is the highest ranked degree that accepts them because that maximizes their chance for getting a job. So that's one reason why you would do it and one reason why we have the demographics on campus that we have. Students are all, you know, they're uniformly great. This isn't really an issue. We're just talking about motivation. The other reason is uh, you want to get a PhD, but your undergraduate performance isn't high enough, you didn't have enough um, experience doing it, you're not entirely sure. So you want to be on campus, interact with faculty members directly, do research, those kinds of things. So I think those are the, the two main reasons why you would do it. I also think that at least in the beginning, um, for most people they just assume that the online degree would not be worth as much or assume that the experience wouldn't be as good. Um, we actually have quite a bit of evidence that, in fact, in some ways, the opposite is true. So I'm expecting those numbers to shift over time um, between, say, um, U.S. and non-U.S. citizens, and we're already seeing that. The, age, the, the, the average age of students is going down. More and more students are graduating and directly coming to this program. And, and so you're gonna start to see some of the issues that you see. But the truth is, so long as our um, sort of foreign policy is set up the way it is, there's gonna be an unlimited number of highly qualified students from outside the U.S. who want to come to the U.S. to pursue a degree. Yeah, one more question. Sure. Um, I know you mentioned that you want to try to get as many people as possible. 
-hmm. Nope. I'm not the slightest bit worried about that. Not even, I'm not even a little bit worried about it. Because the number. Right. If we, if we produce exceptional graduates, that only helps us. I mean, you know, you think those numbers are big, and turn, I'm going to show you some numbers at the end. These numbers are huge. But you know what? University of Michigan is twice our size. Uh, UCLA is more than twice our size. The fact that they produce twice as many uh, CS majors, undergrads as we do, doesn't hurt them. Uh, Georgia Tech is the largest engineering college in the country by a lot. It doesn't hurt our reputation that we're generating twice as many as number eight, right? I just don't think it matters. The students are good, our reputation is good. That will follow the students, that will follow us. It doesn't matter. And it's not as if people are like, well, there's all these people graduating with CS degrees. I don't know what to do with them. By the way, the number of undergraduates in our program has tripled in the last five years. I don't think it's hurt us at all. So that's, that's why I'm not the slightest bit worried about this. All right, I'm gonna quickly run through some of the um, classes that we have, just so you can see that they're real, um, and put faces to this. So advanced operating systems, which probably uh, enjoys a reputation as the hardest graduate course that we've got, um, computer networks, software development processes, uh, machine learning, which enjoys a reputation of being the most awesome course ever taught by anybody. Um, <laughs> You'll notice that in the first batch of courses that we have, we've done a couple of interesting things. We have uh, Georgia Tech faculty, of course, but we have two faculty members who are not faculty at Georgia Tech at the time, one from Brown and, uh, of course, Sebastian, who both of whom are adjunct faculty at, at Georgia Tech, uh, but actually come from Stanford and, and Brown, uh, respectively. Uh, you'll see in a minute that we do two team teaching and we do a bunch of other interesting things like that, and that kept going. We produced another batch. You notice we're producing four or five every semester so that we can uh, have the number of courses that we need. If I were to let you spend the time staring at it, you would realize after a while that we were basically trying to get all the basic courses out and then filling out the ones for the various specializations that, that we have um, in the MSCS. And our goal is to continue doing so. Um, we, in fact, are now at the point where if we didn't produce any more courses, students could graduate uh, with the MSCS in the most popular specializations. But of course, we intend to produce uh, many more courses. Uh, originally, we were planning on something like 20. I think we're on track for 28. Um, my guess is we'll probably end up somewhere in the low 30s, mostly just depending upon what we're willing to do and uh, what Udacity is willing to do. One thing that's worth pointing out is that this format, and I won't belabor this here unless someone really wants to talk about it, uh, allows you to do some um, interesting things, none of which, uh, there's actually words that are about to come out of this, but I don't think you can. You can't hear it, but he's, it's, he's, he's Italian, he's got a wonderful voice, and he's just talking about what's going on. Notice that all of this is sort of very well produced. There are pictures of people. This is the Udacity way. This is, you know, you've got a hand, so it's like you're looking down on a um, whiteboard, and you'll notice that it's in a different plane from the rest of the materials. It's a very, it's a very cute trick. There's a very specific um, piece of equipment that you need to make that work. Um, Michael Lippmann, who's co-teaching with me, actually has one in his office at Brown because they shipped one out to him so that we could, we could do things together. It's actually uh, kind of cool. See, pretty pictures and everything. Then there's people like me. Um, this particular class, the machine learning class that I, I co-teach co with Michael, is uh, designed to be um, treated more like a podcast. So one of us will teach the material for a particular lesson, the other will act as a student. So the person who's doing the teaching prepares all the quizzes, thinks through what it is trying to get across. The person playing the students does no preparation whatsoever. So it's just like being on campus. Um, and uh, we sort of interact. Now, of course, we're both experts in the field. Um, and so it's not like we're coming in completely cold, and we have very completely different sort of philosophical views about what's important about introductory machine learning. Michael's much more about theory, I'm much more about sort of um, applications and uh, sort of what it takes to deal with the practical side of it. And so we have arguments. There's one stretch in one of these where there's uh, like a 15 minute discussion that we were having that wasn't supposed to be part of the class where we were trying to rediscover, to rediscover a proof, try to see if we could figure out how it all worked and the editor thought it was good enough that he just left it in. And the students say that's actually, it really helps them to feel that they're immersed in the class and that there's someone who's advocating for them as a student saying, what you just said made no sense, could you please try to explain it a different way, so sort of so on and so forth. This has been pretty wonderful. You'll also notice that, you know, my handwriting is atrocious. Um, right now, Michael's singing Smooth Criminal. Um, 
<laughs> by Michael Jackson. Um, I will spare you that. But the point is, is that we have this, this sort of interaction. And everyone still brings their own particular style, even though there is still a house style, which is that overhead I'm writing, as opposed to here's a picture of my face and, and slides. And, and I think that turns out to be important and really is one of the reasons why we went with Udacity in the first place, which was to have a house style, was to have something that allowed us to get started quickly, as opposed to having to rediscover um, everything um, for scratch. So now I want to get to the part about what this means for our students now that they're in the program and the lessons that we've learned. And it's basically this. The students love it. Unsurprisingly, I think uh, for them, a lot of them it's, it's an opportunity and it's turned out to be a wonderful experience. But a bunch of things have sort of come out of this. Here are the lessons. There's a bunch more than this, but I like these to begin. First off, it turns out it's not that difficult to create a quality product. Turns out we have good faculty, we have people who want to support it, um, and people care about this. You're unsurprised to hear faculty care about the stuff that they do, um, and so it's actually not that difficult to create a quality product. I mean, it's not easy. It's difficult in that it requires work, as opposed to difficult, like you know, getting a bunch of faculty to agree with something is difficult. It's not that kind of difficult. It's just I want to do it, and I'm willing to grind out. The scalability part is easy, which was the concern that we had in the beginning, except, of course, the parts that are hard. It turns out that day-to-day -day support mostly scales. It's actually not that hard at all, really. It turns out that having 400 students in my class, I mean, I have 300 students in my undergraduate machine learning class that I'll be, I'll be teaching today um, at 1.30. Whatever, they're in a gigantic room where they had 100, I had 300, it doesn't really make a difference. Sure, each of them have the same questions they want to ask, but they're doing it on something like Piazza, so one of them asks the question, it's visible to everyone, an answer is visible to everyone, so the fact that I have three times as many people wanting to ask the same question doesn't mean that I see the question three times as often. The students actually engage in this. If someone asks a question that's already been asked and answered before, the students say, this was already answered, here's where you should go to find it. I mean, it's really actually not more work. What is more work, what doesn't scale, is grading unless you're very clever about the kinds of assignments that you do, so that they're, for example, auto-graded, or you're very clever about peer grading and dealing with all those issues, every new student you get, you need you know, 0.03 of a TA in order to do the grading. And that's the part where the cost scales linearly with the number of students, and that's where you have to bend the cost curve. The students are extremely engaged, both officially and unofficially. As I said, you know, they, they work with one another in classes, but they've actually created huge social networks. I'll show you a couple of examples of that, um, and have basically built up a community. It turns out, I think that notion of community is the important thing here. This is not just a collection of courses. It is a community surrounded by, or sort of built around the notion of a shared experience through a degree. And that is why, you come to Georgia Tech, or you go to Michigan, or you go to UT Austin, or you go to MIT, or you go to wherever it is you got your undergraduate degree. It's a shared experience that matters, and these aren't disconnected courses, and that matters a lot, and a lot of the energy we've had to put into making this degree program work, and that the students have put into it, have basically um, gone around that notion of building community. So that means as a consequence, we're not worried about, well, if I have 300 students, or 500 students, or even 1,000 students in one of my online classes, what am I supposed to do about it? What you're worried about is what happens when you have 10,000 students who want advising, not how do I turn in assignment seven, but should I take this class before this class, or these two things that go well together, what if what I want to be is a data scientist, there is no data science track, does that mean I should take these four classes or D3's class? How do I answer those questions? Each of those questions, while not necessarily unique, is still distinctive enough that it's very difficult to do, here's 500 people at a time, here's what you should do. You really do need more sort of hands-on experience there. Some of which is taken care of by the students, some of which is not. Uh, how do you make that work? How do you scale advising? How do you scale program support and program guidance? Well, the students are sort of taking care of themselves by creating their notions of community. They've self-organized on social media. There are dozens upon dozens of pages on Google+, on Facebook, their communities, they're in LinkedIn, they're in HipChat. They talk to each other constantly. They've subdivided these, these uh, communities by course, by uh, region, by language, by you know, what it is they, they do for a living. They've created groups. Uh, the College of Computing has roughly 36 uh, student organizations. Um, and at least one of them is run uh, by students in OMSCS. About a year ago, if you looked at the main Google Plus um, community, you would see over 3,000 members talking constantly, asking questions. I actually get a notification every time someone asks a question on, on Google Plus and OMSCS, and it just all day, 24 hours a day, bzz, 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 as they're talking. Um, I'll leave it at that. Yes? For discussion boards, yes, mostly. Not in the OMS, but in the 
No, in the OMS version, we use Piazza. Piazza, okay. Yes. Yes. And in addition, you have all these other... Yes, so most of what happens on Google Plus is they're talking about advising-like things. In Piazza, they're talking about the specific course. Okay. Yes. So, did you create the Google Plus groups? No, they created the Google Plus groups. I'm sorry, say that again? Well, it's public, so anyone can go and look at it. Um, I lurk, and I actually answer questions, mostly uh, when the students are saying something wrong. Um, the advisors, which is more often than you want, the advisors uh, typically read it. They actually post there, as well as sending out an email and various other things that they do. Um, they built a FAQ. They actually have this ridiculously large Google spreadsheet, which is a review of every single um, class by all students. You just add a row and, you, and it goes on. I've read, I've, well, I have it in this last semester, but I've read all those reviews. They're there forever. You send people there, they create all these community resources, and it's very interesting to read what they have to say about you, Tucker. Um, and <laughs> you get kind of a, you get a lot out of it. They build this kind of resource and sort of infrastructure for them. Yes, ma'am. No, 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 we have, a, we, we have professional advisors in the college. Um, at this point, three. Uh, who do advising for grad, the master's program, which includes the OMS, yes. So we send all the students a t-shirt. The students post um, on Facebook because that's what 35-year-olds do. Um, and uh, they all, I think, feel a part of the, the larger community. Um, and I think that's a, a good thing. We support them. Um, we talk about them on our Facebook page. We, we make them a part of our, our communication exercise. And I want to say one quick thing about them that surprised me. I mean, it didn't surprise me in retrospect, but I wasn't thinking about it beforehand. And this is, these students are interesting. They're older, they're highly motivated, they care very much. They seek communication by creating these groups, and they also seek control. Um, sometimes to their detriment, but typically to their benefit. So here's just a graph that I think gives you kind of an idea of, of what you see on things like Piazza. So this is my class from two years ago. I did a graph from, you know, I ran the numbers for uh, this past spring and they looked almost identical, you know, appropriately normalized. So I, I think um, this is something consistent. What you see across the x-axis is the number of students in a, uh, in a particular course. What you see on the y-axis is the number of posts, the cumulative sum of the number of posts, okay? So you sort the students for a particular class by the person who said the least, like zero, never ever posted, to the person who posted the most. And you just sort of plot it. So this red line at the time, this, is, this was three years ago, three years ago now, this red line is uh, my on-campus students. Same class, same material, same everything. You'll notice that um, there's about 100, there was about um, 150 of them, a little more, closer to 160, let's say 150 of them. 100 of them never posted once. Then a few of them posted a little, 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 little. It's a power curve, which is how these things always work. And then, you know, the most, the, once you get to sort of cumulative post and the, the, the most prolific person, you end up with um, about 250 posts. The blue line, the online students. Now at that time, the class was smaller because it was the first semester, roughly half as many students producing 10 times as much traffic all but 10 students out of um, the 80 or so only post, didn't post anything. And those numbers have actually gotten bigger. The difference between those two curves has gotten more significant over time. And I think it's because the students interact, they wanna deal with it. So I just turned on Piazza a day later than I meant to, and by the end of the first hour, each one of the, the, well, the two classes that I teach uh, had a pinned post, introduce yourselves, and each of them had 50, 60, 70 people saying, here's who I am, here's what I wanna get out of the class, here's what I wanna do, here's where you can find me on LinkedIn. And they do that for every single class. For one of my classes, they've already created a pin of here are resources that we found that are good, here are things that we've heard from people who've taken the class before, and they start that kind of community, and I basically get to listen in and guide them occasionally. So they're not just their obvious demographics, they're not just older, but this actually matters. They're uniquely qualified, and when you let such uniquely qualified students have some sense of control, some sense of ownership, it improves the class for all of them. Many of them are employed by great companies. The ed tech class includes people who are currently teachers. The health informatics class includes physicians. The machine learning class enjoys people who work on data sciences. Um, Tucker's class almost certainly has people with PhDs in economics in it. These are people who care and they want to, to sort of participate in it 
materially affects the experience um, of the class for the students. These are the numbers I wanted to show you, and then I'm effectively done. Um, we had, um, I don't know why it says research from Harvard. We had uh, two uh, economists from Harvard and someone from public policy who are doing evaluation of our applicants and evaluation of the students who take the course, and they have found a bunch of things. Access to OMSCS students increases the amount of formal education that is actually pursued um, by these students. I won't read it to you. At the bottom line is a, sim a single number. They believe, based on numbers which are actually significantly lower than what we've turned out to have, that this program by itself just the online part, will increase the number of graduate level computer science students 8% a year above what would otherwise have been produced. So Georgia Tech is definitely the largest producer of graduate computer science students in the country, almost certainly in the world, certainly elite ones, and we're personally responsible for a tenth of all the production in the US, effectively. And that number's probably higher than that because it turns out we have more students than we actually expected. I don't think that's unimportant. I don't think that's insignificant. We are getting great students and we are producing great students and we're doing more than anyone else and it's not gonna hurt us at all because they're great students and they're doing great things. This is a big deal, I think. And I think it's turned out, if I had to say this is an unqualified success, then I think it's an unqualified success. So what's next? Um, we're now taking applications year round. Thank you, Susan. Um, we're really having to deal with our minimum requirements. We are ramping up OMS career services and helping students uh, to actually find jobs for those who either don't have them or we're using this so they can do that, but basically provide the same services we do to our undergrads. Um, we're doing outreach to the US military. We're doing international outreach. I visited Sub-Saharan Africa three times. We are about to announce a, um, um, a partnership with IBM Research Africa. Um, I have the personal goal of being the largest producer of graduate IT talent in Sub-Saharan Africa in the world. Uh, we're doing targeted marketing to boost female and underrepresented um, um, groups. And I think we can say that we're hitting there. Having said all that and saying it's an unqualified success, which I genuinely believe, I will point out that we don't yet know whether we've truly succeeded in the sense that this is something you can only know for sure five, 10 years out. So we have a lot of questions. We had a bunch of overwhelming reaction. It started out, a lot of it I think was trepidation. A lot of it was sort of negative. It is now almost uniformly positive, at least to the outside world. We've had something like 700 um, in, uh, unique media hits. Um, Obama has mentioned us by name twice uh, in, in the last year and came to, to visit Georgia Tech, not just because of us, but. Um, <laughs> scalability is still the major question. We have to figure that out. I'm, I'm not worried about advising, but I'm concerned about how we're going to make that work and make it scale uh, when all the sort of initial energy um, runs out. And I will leave it at that. I will just simply say that you can make up all kinds of ways that you might measure success. And I'm going to say that on almost all of those metrics, we are doing uh, remarkably well with this program. And I will leave it at that. Thank you very much for your time, um, and I'll take any questions for the next uh, two and a half minutes. Yes, oh, thank you. faculty driven. So if you want um, the um, human-centered computing uh, specialization to be uh, a part of this, then you should go talk to the faculty who teach those courses on campus and tell them that they should do it. And we've already gotten some interest from several of them, um, and I believe strongly in the sort of JFK sense of the way the world works, that um, once one or two of them do it, then everyone else will follow. And it's really that simple. So we didn't prioritize the areas particularly. The, stu the faculty were interested. Tucker was on the, the original group of people. All those people you saw in the first two cohorts, they were people that were part of the original faculty group that looked into this. They were interested in doing it anyway, and they just happened to represent a subset of the specializations. 
The only thing that we prioritized were classes that would have the maximal impact over the maximum number of specializations and then allowed us to finish specializations. But if all the ETI faculty came to me tomorrow and said, we want to produce five courses um, ready to go in the fall, um, I would push other people out of the way and we would record it and it'd be ready for you to go in 2016. So about how long, uh, follow-up question, about how long does the course take to have, like, uh, hey, where you actually want to get this program to be acclimated? Five, six months. It takes a semester basically to create one of these courses, so then it's really just a question of whether at the time you decide you want to do it, there are already too many people in line ahead of you. And that's really the only question. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you, Professor. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Always happy to follow through.